and welcome to this special webinar that the PCA is hosting today for our retail members. Uh, we've got a good panel lineup for you today, uh, including Joshua Haberski, our head of federal affairs, uh, Patrick Anderson, uh, one of our consultants, um, and also Caitlin Martin, another one of our consultants. And we also have Greg Zimmerman, who's also here that will be able to answer some of your questions as we dive into this a little bit more. I am Scott Pierce. I'm the executive director of the Premium Cigar Association. Uh, just real quick to welcome everybody here, just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, everybody is going to be in uh, listening mode, so therefore be muted that way. Everyone will be able to hopefully hear better that way. But there is a little panel on the right-hand side for questions. So if we're moving along and you would like to ask a question, please go ahead and type it in at the moment that you think of it, and it will collect those questions, and we will go through and address those questions as much as we can when we go through the presentation and be able to address those when we need to. Um, if you're having any issues, there's some audio buttons that are there too to, to be able to listen to. And again, this is being recorded and will be made available after the presentation as well. So on that note, I am going to turn this over to Joshua Herberski, who will go through the presentation and will introduce some of our other speakers that we have here. So uh, let me bring on Josh real quick. So let's see, Josh, you are... Thanks, Scott. Um, you know, this is something that we wanted to, uh, you know, put together uh, in this presentation to go over the multitude of resources that are out there for our retail members. A couple weeks ago, we put together a survey, and one of the responses and requests from an abundance of PCA members was doing a conference call webinar that walked through the process of all the different resources that um, the federal government is providing. Um, you know, we're working consistently, our team, to advocate for programs and relief packages that are beneficial to our members, and we're continuing to do that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a few uh, items that we have uh, put to the front, forefront in Congress, uh, but also, you know, some of the programs synthesized, because, again, we're talking about 800-page bills that happen uh, to pass at, you know, midnight, 2 in the morning. Um, so, you know, we have uh, an overabundance of resources on our website um, as well as uh, through the different communications channels that we've been sending out over the past few weeks, taking a very active role in both advocating and lobbying for proactive measures, but also explaining to our membership the programs that, um, you know, can benefit them. So, you know, we, we have our, our team assembled to walk through um, the different uh, opportunities that are out there, and then also Greg Zimmerman to talk a little bit about first-hand experience and talk about some of the things that he's doing in his stores uh, to, uh, you know, respond to the coronavirus and also the application process from for these government benefits uh, from his first-hand perspective. So we'll dive into it. We've created a COVID-19 PCA portal. Um, in that portal, you will see this site uh, updated on a daily basis. It has all of the news and alerts that have been released to our members, um, you know, from the beginning of this uh, almost daily. Um, and, and all of those materials are housed there for historical record. So you can see what letters we're sending to Congress, what letters we're sending to the Department of Treasury and SBA. Um, that is, this central hub is if you want to search for anything and everything. Um, we do have information that's tailored. Um, our, our marketing uh, marketing director, um, Aaron Holland, has put together the local tobacconist um, page where you can find out some of the different considerations that tobacconists have made. Um, you know, places like Red Shop, you know, you can self-import information there uh, that will be posted on the site. We also have a list of curated resources from small business retail hospitality associations um, that have been impactful, um, you know, in, in the advocacy and lobbying front and synthesizing those materials. So places like the National Retail Federation, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you'll find information there. We also have state and local daily updates. Um, we, we work with uh, an abundance of great contractors, uh, as well as consultants. I know uh, Caitlin and Cozen O'Connor has been sending us daily updates in select states. 
and then summaries for the total states. You can go on this page, find your state, and see the most updated um, order, uh, uh, you know, whether it's a stay-at-home order, what are the government policies that are in place. We also have, and, and this is for the folks that are joining us that are on the manufacturing side predominantly, we do have cigar production notices. Some of the factories have closed. Some of them have, um, you know, issued government decrees. You'll find that information um, on that page. We also have uh, put a significant amount of effort in the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, this is something that was developed through the CARES Act, um, where Senator Marco Rubio and the Senate Small Business um, Committee has really taken a lead on this program. Um, and it's one that is uh, applicable to PCA members. Uh, so we'll dive into that, and I'll explain a lot more about the PPP as we go through uh, this webinar. Um, and then finally, our PCA advocacy and lobbying. What are we doing as an association to help benefit uh, your businesses and kind of create that road to recovery? Uh, so, you know, this is an infographic that we released a couple days ago, and it really, uh, again, we synthesized a lot of the information and the finer points that are important for you as retailers to consider um, and when applying for um, sustaining programs that will help keep your payroll, help keep your businesses afloat. Um, and these are the big four that we will go through um, over the course of this presentation. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, expansion of SBA's economic injury disaster loans, employee retention tax credit, and then assistance for American workers and families. And that third one um, is, is a lot for your employees and individual basis. So this is available on our website on that main page that I just referenced. So the Paycheck Protection Program is a $350 program providing forgivable loans to retail businesses that are under 500 employees used towards job retention and other expenses. Um, this is provided by approved lenders. Uh, it is preferred that you use the uh, bank that you traditionally bank your business with. Um, this program launched on April 3rd. Um, you know, it is a successful program in that it can provide relief to retailers, people in the hospitality industry. However, there is um, an exceeding demand for this program, um, and it has had a bit of a shoddy rollout. Some of you may have gone on on April 3rd, had, had your applications ready to go, and your bank wasn't ready to process that information, or the government didn't relay the information to the lender about the specific technical guidance to process those loans. So some, some folks may have been able to get the loans submitted and even approved by now, but um, others, um, they, they are encountering issues. The site uh, of the Small Business Administration did crash due to the demand. I've heard reports that um, the actual demand for all of the eligible businesses um, for this program would be upwards of $3 trillion. And again, only $350 billion are allocated. Um, so it is a uh, first it's come, first serve basis if you meet the eligibility requirements. The application and information are available on that web portal. We have a dedicated section for this program. Um, and again, PCA is advocating for the expansion and reforms of the payment protection program. Um, here is the uh, Payment Protection por uh, Program portal on the PCA website. So you'll have information and overview provided by the Department of Treasury. Uh, this is really administered by Treasury and the Small Business Administration, but required congressional action. So the CARES Act, which I, I referenced, was the legislative vehicle. They are making correction to this. Uh, Congress, as we speak, is working on making improvements to this program, which then would be, um, you know, regulated and guidance would be issued by Treasury and the Small Business Administration. So you have information for, um, you know, lenders. That's more for, for your bank. Um, borrowers, which is your business. And then the actual physical application that you would send in. 
So the application you can apply through an existing SBA 7A lender or through any federally insured depository institution, credit union, foreign credit institution that's participating. Um, other regulated lenders will be available to make these loans once they are approved and enrolled in the program. You should consult with your local lender as to whether it is participating. So, you know, if you haven't done anything already, first step in the process is contact your bank, whoever you bank with your business right now. Um, this program is open until uh, June 30th, 2020, uh, but the money, as we mentioned, is going to dry up. So um, get your applications in early if you have not done so already. So the eligibility for this, as we mentioned, it's uh, small businesses that are fewer than 500 employees, um, small businesses that meet the SBA size standard. Um, this also applies to nonprofit organizations, nonprofits that are under 500 employees that are classified in the tax code as C3 can apply for this. Uh, we do know that there are uh, a few nonprofits out there that um, are in the cigar space that would be eligible. Uh, for this uh, program. Um, individual sole proprietors, independent contractors, although the contractors and the folks that are in the so-called gig economy, the application um, uh, portal opens for them on April 10th. So if you are um, classified in that, you know, if you are somebody that does uh, 1099 work, um, you know, traditionally or uh, you're not classified as an employee, you uh, would have to apply for those benefits um, uh, a little bit later. An individual who is self-employed and regularly carries on any trade or business, uh, tribal businesses, and then veterans organizations, um, those are the main eligibility requirements. So, you know, the question that we've been getting from members, how can I borrow? Um, how much can I borrow? Loans can be two times uh, 2.5 times the borrow, bor borrower's average monthly payroll cost, um, and it can exceed $10 million. $10 million is the um, max for that. And in order to calculate the average monthly payroll, it's the sum of included costs minus the sum of excluded payroll costs. That That is how this formula is calculated. And, you know, in this slide deck, which, you know, the presentation will be available afterwards, and a lot of these um, points are made in other resources on our webpage, but here is a list of what's included and what is excluded in, in, when we go to the next slide. So when it's respective to employees, salary, wages, commissions, or similar compensation, um, payment of cash tips or the equivalent, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, uh, allowance for dismissal or separation, payment for required, um, for the provisions of the group health care benefits, including insurance premiums, any retirement uh, benefits, and the payment of state and local tax assessed on the compensation of the employee. So that is all that can be factored in that included part of the equation in, in putting together your app application. So what is excluded? Uh, compensation of an individual employee in excess of an annual salary of $100,000 as prorated for the February 15th to June 30th, 2020 period. Uh, payroll taxes, uh, railroad uh, retirement taxes and income taxes, any compensation of an employee whose principal place of residence is outside the United States, uh, qualified sick leave wages for which credit is allowed under a uh, specific section of Family First Coronavirus Response Act, um, or qualified leave wages, which credit is allowed under. So there's a separate program for, for that, um, which uh, I, I know that Caitlin addresses in um, her comments. So, you know, that is what is excluded from uh, what you can apply for in, in this program. Um, you know, finally, before I kick it over to Caitlin to go over some of the other programs, um, again, the Paycheck Protection Program is probably the most useful program for our retail businesses. Um, it, this will provide cash assistance far quicker than emergency disaster loans. Um, I saw a report yesterday that once your application is processed and received, 
the average disbursement of funds is 72 hours in this program um, versus 21 days for the emergency loan. So, um, again, we can't emphasize this enough. Get your applications in. Um, I am um, fielding about 25 to 30 individual member calls every single uh, week. Um, some of them are specifics. I'm happy to research, walk you through the process. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have, we aren't filling out applications for individual members, but we're doing the next best thing. And, um, you know, my prior role was working for uh, a community bank uh, association. So I do have experience on that front um, and help and willing to help you actually see that process through and provide some of that detailed information. On the advocacy front, we sent a letter to Treasury and uh, the SBA as well as Congress advocating for three core items in phase four. Um, you know, phase three was the CARES Act, um, which, you know, it, it was the main financial assistance, the, the over $2 trillion in different benefits to affected industries. So now we're working on phase four. Um, the previous ones were mainly dealt with employ, um, employment, sick leave, um, and the first was on actual medical response and research of the coronavirus. So, um, you know, the CARES Act and this subsequent one, phase four, um, will be critical in getting this improved. So, again, in addition to working on getting these benefits that are already available to you, we're advocating for additional resources. One, one of it is the payroll protection flexibility. We want to allow the loan to be forgivable, forgivable at a minimum of six months after your business fully reopens and allow a larger allocation of money to be used for rent and other expenses. Um, as with many small businesses, our members need more flexibility with the funds uh, and how they'll be used following the acceptance in the program. We want you to be able to use these funds to address problems that have been caused by the coronavirus as you see fit. No one knows your businesses better than you do. Um, so we want to put the money and give that discretion, discretion to you. Uh, expanding the program, again, we mentioned that, um, you know, this is something where demand uh, really exceeds uh, what is available. Um, we are, are calling on doubling uh, the allocation for this program. Um, in news reports, it's been, report, uh, it's been cited that they're looking to increase this program by $200 billion uh, for um, phase four. Um, again, this is unprecedented um, legislative and regulatory work that has been coming together and very quickly. Um, so, you know, despite the, the glitches in the system, this is a very useful pro uh, program, and we, we need to see this expanded, especially in certain areas that didn't have, um, you know, the availability or don't have the av availability of these loans through their financial institutions. Um, thirdly, we want to see the enhancement of the system administration. Um, you know, we need to meet this demand. Um, we need to see technological, financial, and human and cap capital advancements within the smaller small business administration to really, um, you know, fortify this program, improve it, and make sure that it's effectively administered. Um, I'll turn it over to Caitlin Martin uh, now uh, to go over some of the other benefits. Hi there. Um, thanks, Josh, for um, passing that over. One thing I just want to highlight when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program is that as long as um, small businesses spend at least 75% of that, this, uh, this loan turns into a grant. These are You do not have to pay back the loan so long as at least 75% of what you've gotten through the PPP program is used towards payroll costs. So really, Congress's intent here with this, with the PPP program and with some of the other programs I'm about to walk through really was ensuring that small businesses are able to keep employees on the payroll during this 
you know, really challenging time, understanding that folks are trying to meet payroll obligations and keep the lights on. So um, one additional thing, as Josh mentioned, is that this money is going to go quickly for the PPP program. We do expect that um, Senator McConnell, Leader McConnell, is has been speaking with Democrats in the Senate on trying to put $250 billion more into the PPP program. Um, Congress is working on trying to iron out the details. They've understood that this initial um, bucket of funds will go quickly as small businesses like yourselves avail, avail yourselves of this opportunity. So definitely get your applications in. Um, so another option for uh, small business retailers is the CARES Act expanded um, SBA's longstanding economic injury disaster loan program. These EIDL loans, many of you are likely familiar with, um, they are SBA's programs for business owners in regions impacted by declared disasters like hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, etc. Um, the CARES Act expanded the EIDL program to um, ensure that businesses impacted by COVID-19 are able to um, are able to survive. So, on who is eligible for these expanded EIDL loans? Can I get the next slide, please? Sorry about that. For who is eligible? So, any entity that su that suffered um, substantial economic injury caused by COVID-19, so long as you were in existence on January 31st of this year. So this includes um, businesses with fewer than 500 employees, includes cooperatives, ESOPs, tribal small businesses with fewer than 500 employees, uh, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and most private nonprofits. So um, looking at the loan parameters, the maximum that a small business can take is two million in a working capital loan, and that's going to be at a 3.75% rate over a 30-year term. Um, the CARES Act ensured that these coronavirus-related EIDL loans would be able to be deferred for up to for up to a year, so that businesses are able to get back on their feet before they have to start paying down um, on this loan. Uh, one of the other things the CARES Act really focused on is making it easier for small businesses to quickly get these loans without having to put up as much personal collateral or having to prove that they were eligible to get credit elsewhere. So some of the changes included that $200,000 can be approved without a personal guarantee. Um, approval, to simplify things, they made approval based on a credit score and they are not requiring first-year tax returns. Um, borrowers do not have to prove that they could not get credit elsewhere. Again, that was a significant change to SBA's um, existing program. And they are not requiring collateral for loans of $25,000 or less. Um, but borrowers must allow SBA to review its tax return. So one thing I want to mention, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, is that um, for folks that re are relying on the Paycheck Protection Program, you cannot, the Paycheck Protection Program prohibits borrowers from taking out two loans for the same purpose. So you can get both a PPP grant and an EIDL loan, but you can't double dip and use both of those loans for the same purpose. So on to the next slide. Um, in the CARES Act expansion of EIDL loans, Eligible applicants are able to receive a $10,000 emergency grant within three days of applying to help folks uh, keep the lights on and um, help get immediate relief. So this is a grant. There's no obligation to repay this grant unless you also avail yourselves of the PPP program. If you are able to secure a PPP loan, then that $10,000 grant will be subtracted from the forgiveness amount. So again, you can apply for both a PPP grant and an EIDL loan, but the money needs to be used for different purposes and that $10,000 emergency grant will be subtracted from the forgiveness amount. Um, you can apply online. SBA has tried to make this a simplified process. Um, they have a disaster assistance website set up with a step-by-step -step process to walk through this. Great um, FAQ documents 
and really trying to help you walk through through the process. Um, a, a third option that I want to discuss that the CARES Act created, and this is again in line with Congress's goal and intent of trying to encourage businesses not to lay off, not to furlough employees in the interim, but really keep folks on the payroll. This is the Employee Retention Tax Credit, the ERC. So this is a brand new retention tax credit for employers who have had to close, partially close, or are experiencing significant revenue losses as a result of the coronavirus. Um, it's designed, again, to encourage employers to keep employees on the payroll, despite the economic hardship we know everyone is facing. Um, what I do want to quickly highlight is that if you have to choose, as a retailer and an employer, you have to choose whether or not you want to um, apply for a grant through the Paycheck Protection Program or go forward with an employee retention tax credit option. You're not eligible for the tax credit if you avail yourself of the PPP grant program. So it's a decision that folks um, are making depending on what makes the most sense for their business. We expect for, for this group, the majority of small business mom and pop premium cigar retailers will likely find the PPP program a bit more appealing um, for their business. Uh, next slide. So who is eligible for the employee retention tax credit? Um, any private employer, including nonprofits, um, that have been in business in 2020 that have operations partially or fully suspended as a result of these government shutdown orders, these shelter in place orders as a re um, result of COVID-19, and or, or anyone that's experienced a decline in gross receipts by more than 50% in a quarter compared to that same quarter from last year, from 2019. Um, how much is this tax credit? The new employee retention tax credit, it's a 50% tax credit for the first $10,000 of compensation you pay to an employee that includes the employer portion of health benefits for each el eligible employee. Um, the compensation does not include paid sick or family leave time um, that was um, that was recently added as a requirement under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So again, this is just 50% um, tax credit for the first 10,000 of compensation and the employer portion of health benefits. Uh, this credit will apply to wages paid after March 12th. 2020 and before January 1 of next year. So which employees count towards eligibility? Um, any employer that has more than 100 employees. For those full-time employees who are being paid but are not providing a service due to the full or partial shutdown, these folks are eligible. You're el th these employees are eligible. You're eligible to deduct from um, and, and to avail yourself of this tax credit. Um, also for employers with 100 or fewer full-time employees, all employees regardless of whether or not those employees are still working, they are able to count towards eligibility. Um, employers are not able to, to claim the same employee for this credit and the work opportunity tax credit for the same period. Um, again, I, and these slides are going to be made available after the fact. I realize this is a little bit more technical, but the next slide, I think, helps um, clarify how this credit is paid and um, why some folks might lean more towards the paid check protection program as opposed to the tax credit option. So the refundable tax credit is applied against the employer portion of payroll taxes. Employers are, el are able to be immediately reimbursed for the credit by immediately reducing their required deposits on those payroll taxes that have been withheld from your employees' wages. Um, so eligible employers, all you have to do if you want to take advantage of the tax credit is report your total qualified wages and the related health insurance costs for each quarter, um, beginning with the second quarter of this year, you have to fill out the form 7200 advanced payment of employer credit and 
you're also eligible to request an advance um, by filling out the form 7200. And in that case, I believe within three days, they should be sending you um, an advance of that refundable tax credit. So uh, it's a little complicated. I think the way to look at the PPP program versus the, um, the um, tax credit would be thinking about the PPP as long as you're using 75% of that grant to cover payroll costs, that's it, it, it's, it's not a loan. It turns into a grant. It's essentially you know money from the government to help you. Whereas this is more look, you can look at it more as a deferral. Yes, you are able to take um, a tax credit now, but eventually you will still have to um, you know it's just a, it's a temporary tax credit than the interim. Um, the final thing that I wanted to cover today is uh, the economic impact payments that were included in the CARES Act. Um, this is sort of the stimulus payments that Congress passed to try to get immediate as quickly as possible in the hands of all Americans um, based on income to help folks in the weeks following um, as, we, as we deal with the COVID-19 situation. So any, um, anyone who earns less than $75,000 um, or $150,000 for married couples filing jointly, they're going to receive a one-time payment of $1,200 from the government per individual or $2,400 um, per married couple filing jointly. In addition, they're going to see checks of $500 for each qualifying child. Um, there's also, this is a, sort of obviously it's based on income and it's phased out as you, as we reach a higher income. So the payment is reduced by $5 for each $100 for folks that make more than $75,000 a year. Um, and it's capped at individuals that make $99,000 a year in earnings or $198,000 per couple. So again, if you make less than $75,000 a year, you will be seeing in the next couple of weeks um, a check for $1,200 from the government to help during this time. Um, if you make, again, it's capped at individuals that make $99,000 or $198,000 per couple. This is really targeted to folks that need this money the most. Um, there's no need to apply. Uh, they are working on qualification based on past IRS data. So if you file taxes in 2019, they will take that into account. Um, if you have not yet, they will rely on 2018 data. And no, no need to apply um, IRS. For those that have filed before, this will be an automatic process. Um, and that I you should see these checks coming out in the next couple of months. Hopefully they are helpful to your employees, folks that work for you, and um, as, as people are trying to pay their bills and get through the next couple of months. Thank you, Caitlin, for I that information. That uh, we'll get, we'll get uh, Greg and uh, Patrick on the screen now. If anyone has any questions um, that are on the individual basis, I put my contact information on this uh, screen and I can follow up with folks afterwards. Um, if you have any other questions that you feel comfortable that would be good for the good of the group, um, please submit that through our, our question chat box. Um, uh, Greg and, and Patrick will, will be discussing some of the individual basis. One of the things that I did want to point out that's a non-governmental resource that a few of our retailers have um, you know mentioned and, and uh, called it to our attention is that um, they are looking to their individual insurance policies. Um, there are some insurance policies that have a clause in there um, that cites closure by civil authority. Um, so, you know, that is something that, um, you know, I would encourage you to look into your policy um, to see if that might be a, an avenue where you could get resources from. Um, I, you know, we, we have a few folks that are exploring that opportunity, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Again, these slides will be available as well as the full recording on our full resource page. Um, Patrick and Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Um, uh, Greg, first of all, uh, 
thank you for uh, taking some time away from your business to be here today. Um, you know, appreciate uh, your role as, as a volunteer board member uh, for PCA um, because you also have a business to run um, seven days a week uh, with the tobacco uh, company cigars uh, out of Pennsylvania. Um, it's a traditional brick and mortar business. You have walk-in humidor lounges, all things that customers are used to having access to uh, when they go to uh, enjoy cigars and buy cigars. Um, how have you adapted your business you know, with the new social distancing restrictions that are out there? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Patrick. Good question. Uh, that, that has kind of changed as this whole process and this crisis has manifested over the past uh, you know, three, four, five weeks. Uh, when we first, uh, the first initial outbreak, uh, we immediately closed our lounges and restricted the amount of people that were allowed in our stores. But as that was elevated and states all across the country went to a stay at home order, which uh, Pennsylvania did fairly early, probably compared to uh, some of the others, uh, we had to change again. Now we've always done some type of uh, mail order internet comp component to our sales. It was a very small piece of our business. Uh, it's a very competitive field to, to try and compete on in that, uh, in that venue. Um, so what we did, we went to a, a curbside concierge so people would uh, call their orders in and we would kind of run them out to them or they would come to the door and place the orders. Uh, and as it got elevated to its highest level where we are today, uh, basically what we're doing is we're accepting call-in orders or um, email orders, internet orders, and we will take those orders, we will call that uh, consumer, that customer back, uh, process the order over the phone, get their uh, credit card information, run the sale, and coordinate a time for a pickup. Uh, when they come to the store, they'll ring the store again, we will set their delivery out on a uh, sanitized table with a hand sanitizing uh, station, and they can pick, lock the door behind the, when the clerk comes back in, and uh, then they can pick up an order knowing that it's uh, uh, well taken care of. Uh, and we've also limited the uh, the employees in the store. Uh, we are uh, keeping one employee in each store to process those orders, so there's no um, chance of them uh, interacting people or other other uh, employees uh, we've had to uh, we've kept all our employees on the payroll uh, uh, we are planning our participate participating in the PPP programs a great program fits us you know I think better than all the other ones that we looked at uh, so we, uh, we look forward to uh, that long process with our bank so you you mentioned that you've always had um, a little bit of mail order uh, business folks folks that would call in orders and you'd send it out to them or deliver locally um, are you thinking about increasing sort of your online presence and um, and increasing that aspect of of your business for the long term yeah we're currently looking at that again i i think uh, you know the, these are all good life lessons and you know, who could have anticipated what we're currently going through any business? I mean, this is unprecedented. We, you know, and obviously in, in my lifetime, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, but yes, I think what we're going to do is we're going to explore more options uh, to have that flexibility to, uh, in case something like this would ever happen again. I pray it doesn't, but, uh, you know, I just want to be prepared. But it, it will become a, uh, or uh, integral part of our, our business, I think. And uh, we're, we're currently exploring that uh, that scenario right now. Gotcha. So how, how has this impacted um, your sales team? Have you had to, uh, you mentioned that you've been able to keep folks uh, on the payroll, um, but obviously with the, with the new curbside uh, service, it, it changes sort of the, the function, the day-to-day -day function of the, uh, of, yeah. the, of the business, how, how has that impacted those guys? 
again, it, it, it was all a learning curve because it was all new to us. It, it's you're kind of doing twice the work uh, for probably you know half the revenue. Uh, so we uh, most most of the employees are are staying at home. So we we're, we're limiting the um, the amount of uh, interaction that uh, the employees uh, have with each other, and we're just keeping it to uh, basically two or three employees uh, plus myself. Um, so I'm sorry, your question was how did we? How how has that how has it impacted your sales team? And you know, I think you 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 cover you you're, you're reducing the number of employees in the stores. Um, it, it, right, it's, it's day by day. I mean, there's some days it would it was uh, we actually had uh, days of revenue that would have been a good day if nothing had ever changed. But uh, there are some very very slow days as well. Uh, weather definitely impacts that. Um, but uh, I think that it overall, it's been very well received by our consumer, our customer. They're very appreciative of us taking that extra step and ensuring that uh, our staff is safe and that they're safe. So you, you mentioned that, um, that you availed yourself to the PPP program. Um, could you share a little bit about for why, why you, when you looked at the programs available, what, what led you to that one, why you thought that was the best, better fit for your business? Uh, to me, it looked like it was the quickest way to inject uh, some uh, income or some revenue into our business to ensure that we can keep those uh, uh, employees on. Um, I looked at it and I thought, you know, I, I think one of the most important things coming out of this is that I don't want to have to retrain or train seven, eight new employees, 10 employees uh, coming out of this. I, I would hope that I could step right back into business as usual and being able to keep the, uh, the employees that I had before. So, um, the, the speed, uh, the ease of the application looked fairly easy compared to maybe some of the other ones that I, I didn't really study the EIDL and some of those, you know, the tax credit in depth as I did with the PPP, uh, but it just looked like an easier process. I know there's been some frustration, uh, me personally, uh, and, and some of my uh, uh, other retailers out there that if you bank with one of the larger banks, uh, they've been a, a little bit slower to respond and to to get these portals open and get these applications out. And that's the case. I mean, I'm still waiting for our portal to be opened. Uh, I know the information that they need, and I've collected that data with my accountant. You know, I have my K1s, 941s, uh, my payroll information. Um, you know, obviously, you need your EIN number when you're doing this application, but uh, the application. Uh, they tell me once this portal is open is is going to be fairly streamlined and pretty easy to navigate. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg. Appreciate you um, sort of giving us a, a little bit of an overview of you know how things have changed with your business um, and also um, your experience with the PPP process. Um, is there is there any other advice that you would uh, recommend for your know, fellow PCA members um, as they're dealing with this, uh, working with their banks, um, information that they should go ahead and start assembling now um, before they before they start the application process? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the first thing is contact whoever does your payroll. You may do it yourself, uh, or if you use a uh, a payroll firm, uh, I would con or an accountant call them and have them prepare um, your incomes or your uh, payroll statements over the last 12 months, or even if you wanted to do all 2019. That way, it, it's easy for them to uh, kind of get that that total that they can uh, use the uh, figure out the monthly average. Um, you may want to have. Uh, you know your your tax return from last year. Uh, I know there's some difference with uh, sole proprietors and independent contracts. So, uh, independent contractors. So uh, I think you need 1040s for sole proprietors and 1099s for your independent contractors. Um, most of the banks seem to be requiring that you've had a previous relationship, prior relationship with them. Uh, so 
Um, if you are with one of the community banks, it seems to be, uh, has already happened. I know some businesses, we all deal with uh, business owners in, in our um, cigar shops every day. And I've spoken with quite a few of them uh, via phone. And some of them have already had their uh, checks processed and are in their accounts. Uh, again, some of the larger ones, Citigroup, you know, Bank of America, Santander, some of the big banks are still uh, still rolling it out. Gotcha. Thank you, Greg. Um, appreciate appreciate your perspective and, and your sharing your experience with these programs. Yeah, no problem. So with the last few minutes here, we've got we've had a, a number of different questions that have popped up here. Um, I know Josh, if you've been able to see those or not, um, but a couple of them are pretty detailed and we can kind of work through those a little bit. Uh, but I did want to ask the first question here uh, is how does payments to employees impact the employees' abilities to receive unemployment benefits? Yeah, Scott, I'll take that one. I think that's in reference to the checks that will be coming out um, on the individual basis, those $1,200 checks for for indiv individuals within a uh, certain income threshold. That does not affect um, unemployment benefits. Uh, individuals still can, um, you know, apply for those. Um, your individual employees, if you've had to lay people off, um, that's a resource that um, we'll add to the site for um, individual uh, that that may have been laid off, so that um, folks can share that with anybody if that has had to deal with that. Um, also, saw uh, a note about the um, uh, the tax deadline. Yes, the individual tax deadline has been moved from April to July. Um, so, you know, there, there'll be some additional de deductions. Mo if you work with an accountant or uh, even a tax firm, uh, they will have most likely sent out that notice already. There could be some additional tax deductions um, that, that come through for individuals as well as businesses as these things are, um, you know, uh, debated. So um, I, I've been recommended by folks and been recommending to wait a little bit um, on, on actually filing your taxes if you haven't done so already. Great. All right. And, um... So this one, um, so Brian, I'm going to go ahead and try to read through this and make sure that I get it as uh, complete as possible so that we can try to answer this. And if not, we can definitely go try to find this information. But Brian says he's been looking and looking for the online form that the IRS says is coming for him to update his address and bank information for a direct deposit for the stimulus payments. He said he's moved in his uh, banking information has changed since filing his 2018 tax returns and have not yet and doesn't plan to uh, – to until July to file for 2019. So he's wondering if there's any guidance on how to do this online or does he need to complete the form 8822 and quote unquote mail it in, which is known as the Assistance for American Workers and Family Payments Program. I, I hope that's accurate, Brian, if they give me maybe a thumbs up on the questions as far as putting all that together. Um, but Josh, Caitlin, Patrick, uh, any insights or Greg, any insights on that one? Thanks, Brian. Caitlin, do you have any information on that? Um, if not, I can uh, research this one individually. Um, but I, my, my guess is that it, this is a bit of a unique situation. I mean, with the, the direct deposits, um, if that information isn't on file with uh, IRS and Treasury, um, there is going to have to be a manual update, and it's likely that that payment um, will be you know, significantly delay versus the other payments that will be going through. Yeah, Josh, this is Caitlin. Um, you, you're you're correct. I'm actually looking at the IRS's web page right now, and um, they Treasury is planning on developing a web-based portal for individuals to provide their banking information to the IRS online, so that those folks um, who have had address changes or situation changes. Um, based on their tax filings from 2018 or 2019, that, um, that way the IRS knows there is um, updated information so that they can receive those payments immediately as opposed to a check in the mail. I believe Treasury is still currently working on developing that portal. I do not believe it has been um, fully 
uh, rolled out just yet, but stay tuned to the IRS website. They've got a great um, FAQ that breaks down everything you need to know about um, how and it's being updated daily. And that's something that will also add to our advocacy, um, you know, efforts. And, and uh, you know, we're talking with SBA and Treasury almost every other week. Um, that's something that we'll bring up and kind of ask what the status of that is. You know, it will be a web-based portal. It's going to be, um, you know, that will be the likely avenue that will be the best for the quickest submission. Um, you know, it won't be, there may be a mail-in option, but that will be significantly delayed, um, and there is a lot of processing. We know that with the small business processing and the uh, techno technological um, framework that has been up there with a lot of the PPP processing, that has passed. So we know that um, with Treasury, they're trying to do the due diligence and get this program uh, and portal up and running so that it will be efficient and able to meet the demand of what will be out there. And likely, there's a lot of other individuals that have moved around over the course of the, the past few months and year, years that will have to, you know, make the submission and change. All right, great. So, yeah, uh, the government says it's going to be happening this week. Probably won't happen for another month. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> keep paying attention to the IRS webpage. Um, for the, um, I think this is kind of a follow up, and I believe it was answered, but I just want to circle back and make sure. Uh, following on to the question about payment to employees or impacting their ability to receive unemployment, a follow up was asked about if you're using the PPP proceeds to continue to pay your employees, does that have any impact on their ability to receive unemployment, or can they continue to get those the, those benefits while still getting uh, paid through the PPP? Um. Caitlin, if you want to confirm this one, but my understanding is that you cannot, you know, receive funds from, from both because you would be still getting paid through your employer that you wouldn't be able to um, get unemployment at that time when you start, um, you know, being accepted into that. Josh, this is Caitlin. Um, just piggybacking off of that. So if, if folks have already laid off some of their staff, they can still apply for that PPP loan. And you're eligible, as long as you rehire those folks, um, before the end of the month of June, you are going to be eligible for full loan forgiveness. It's not your employees that are receiving a portion of the PPP, it's you as the employer. So your ability to apply for the PPP program should not in the interim before you decide to rehire those laid off staffers, it should not impact their ability to collect unemployment, but you do need to rehire those folks before the end of the month of June in order to qualify for that full forgiveness of the loan. Okay, so then it works as yeah. if in this way. Then it, the the unemployment right now is to is a stopgap between now and when we'd be able to rehire them by getting the PPP uh, loans in. And once we get the PPP loans in, we rehire them before June thirtieth. Their unemployment then would stop, and they'd be come back on the payroll using those PPP funds. Correct? Yep, correct. You got it, Scott. Perfect. Great. And, and and my point is that you know you're not going to as an individual get two checks, one from unemployment benefits and one from PPP, that the discretion of the employer and the way that that system um, is, is in place and will operate, that will be a check against that from, you know, people getting two, um, you know, sets of, of money from the government. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, we are just about ready to wind down our time here. If there's anybody else, we got maybe time for one more question if anybody has one. Uh, but if not, as always, you can always reach out to us, Josh at PremiumCigars.org or Joshua at PremiumCigars.org, Scott at PremiumCigars.org. If you have any questions, anything comes up, we are here to help. We kind of know where to look through the haystack to try to find the needles as much as we possibly can. And, and that's why we're here, right? We want to make sure that you guys get all the best resources and, and all the best information to, to help you guys and so um, thank you very much for joining us today please continue to reach out to us uh, we, we wish all of you so much of the, the best of everything when we're going through all of this and please let us know at any time if we can be of any service hey hey scott before we uh disconnect here there 
on on that last topic i wanted to touch on that if i could oh sure uh, it, it's kind of a question and it was my understanding and i'm i read this i think it was on the uh one of the sba forms that it, if you still lay off an employee uh, you can still apply for the the ppp program but if that employee there are some instances where the employee may be better off being laid off. Uh, they may receive more benefits than if they just continue to stay on the payroll. But if that person stays off, then at the end, uh, the forgiveness will be reduced by the percent decrease in the number of employees. So let's say you have 10 employees that you have on this PPP program and you're paying them, and one of them stays in the laid, laid off position, um, you're going to reduce the amount of the loan forgiven by about 10, by 10%. Did, did, am I gotcha. articulating yep. correctly, Caitlin or Josh? That That's what I read. and That was my understanding of how that works with laid off employees. That, that's correct. I, 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 yep, I can confirm that. Well, right, thank great. you everybody right. for, for tuning in. The, uh, the one thing that I would say is uh, that uh, if you're available tomorrow, we're doing a Facebook Live with Rocky Patel, and then Friday uh, also at 3 p.m. on the PCA Facebook page, uh, Scott Pierce uh, and Glenn Loop from Cigar Rights of America will be providing an industry update. Uh, so we hope that you will turn, tune in for, for both of those, and we'll have more digital activities um, in, in the weeks and weeks to come, as always, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have uh, further questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We appreciate it, and uh, stay safe. Thank you, everyone.